Hello, I'm Seema Rao, Deputy Director and Chief Experience Officer of the Akron Art Museum. And I cannot tell you how thrilled I am uh, to be on Facebook Live right now, hooray. Um, and I'm very happy to be here with one of the Gorilla Girls, um, who all of the Gorilla Girls take the names of artists who are no longer with us, but really important in the canon of art history. So Kata Kolowitz is really a wonderful dress person, such an interesting artist. Um, but before I talk about that, I want to invite everybody in the whole world, but certainly the people who are in uh, Northeast Ohio to come down to see the show that this um, is supporting. Totally rad is from totally from the Akron Art Museum's collection and it features works from the 1980s. And many of the issues that we dealt with in the 1980s, I can say that I am certainly um, somebody who was alive in the 80s, are still issues that are very relevant today. And so the show um, gives you a sense of not just history, but really things that happen today. It is a pendant show to Totally Radical, both of which were curated by our very own assistant curator, Jeffrey Katzen. And the show closes on September 19th. So I hope that everybody comes down. Um, as I like to say, parking in Akron in on the weekends is free. So it's very easy to come down or come around wherever you are in Northeast Ohio. I hope you come to visit. And we have many resources online if you are only Facebook friends with the Akron Art Museum. The Gorilla Girls are an artist collective that started in the 1980s. And the thing that's really important is that they were dealing with many issues like racial injustice, sexual injustice, gender disparity in art museums. And these artists all remain anonymous. So if you see a gorilla girl, they'll be wearing the mask that you see here. And we'll hear a little bit more about their work, but I think it's imperative to know that their work is still in incredibly important today. Many of the issues that you read about in the newspaper are still things that they're dealing with. So I will turn it over to them. And then afterwards, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat in Facebook, and I will be able to um, ask those questions for you. So thank you very much. Okay, so um, I'm Katja Kolwitz. I'm a founding member of the Gorilla Girls and I've been involved with just about everything the group has done, hundreds of projects from 1985 to yesterday when we did another new one and designed an exhibition. So um, I wanna share a screen now and I'm gonna take you through a bunch of things. And I'm going to start by showing a video of our latest projects, which I'm going to talk about more at the end. What do art historians call the macho, hetero, predominantly white male perspective in European and American art that depicts women as sexual objects for the pleasure of male viewers? The male gaze but the Gorilla Girls call it the male grays. There are lots of naked women in post-colonial Western art, sleeping in the backyard, splayed out on beds, lounging around with their friends, bathing, dancing, hooking up, being harassed, abducted, bound, raped, and murdered. When we looked into how some revered male artists used and abused women in their real lives, we saw more than gazing, we saw grazing. So the question we wanna ask is, does life imitate art or art imitate life? Gauguin abandoned his wife and five children to become primitive in the Caribbean and South Pacific. He married a succession of teenage girls as young as 13. He died of syphilis at 55 and probably gave it to many of them. European colonialism at its finest. Of the women who had long-term relationships with Picasso, two died by suicide, two had nervous breakdowns, and one escaped and wrote about it. In 1950, sculptor Dorothy Daner decided her husband, sculptor David Smith, had hit her once too often. She loaded her pickup truck and took off for New York to start a career of her own. Smith turned around and married one of his young students. 
According to the book Ninth Street Women, Hans Hoffman's summer school in Provincetown was a harem. And Hoffman, the bull elephant who patted his female students on the ass and fucked everything that moved. Lucien Freud admitted to having 14 children by 12 different women. He may have fathered twice as many. He said women go downhill at the age of 16. Sir Lawrence Gowing, principal of the slave school, pimped for Freud, admitting young girls to the art school who had caught Freud's eye. Chuck Close invited his female students from Yale to the studio to sit for portraits. The ones who refused to undress were given $100 and told to leave. The ones who stayed endured prying questions about their sex lives while posing naked. Get ready for the male graves. The Gorilla Girls take on our culture's enduring love affair with bad male behavior in art. What do art historians... Oh. Sorry. Anyway, I am a founding member of the Gorilla Girls. I've been involved with just about everything the group has done. And I love doing this fierce, game-changing work about sexism, racism, and corruption in art, culture, and politics. We create political art that uses the persuasive strategies of advertising, shows people something they didn't know before, and has the power to change their minds. And I'm thrilled to be with you um, right after the launch of our newest project, The Male Gaze, Graze, <laughs> excuse me, which I'm gonna talk about later, but first, okay. Um, I know we all can't hear each other today, so we're, we're uh, an audience in all different places, but it's a tough time in the world right now. Demagogues, fascists, and white supremacists are on the rise. And then there's the pandemic, income inequality, extreme poverty, cataclysmic climate change. So even though we're on Facebook Live, how about all starting out with one huge collective scream? One, two, three. Ah! I hope that was a lot louder if you could put us all together. Okay, now a little bit about what it's like to be a girl again. Okay, imagine your women artists pissed off that almost all the opportunities in the art world go to white men. Imagine you go to a protest outside the Museum of Modern Art in New York after it opens an international exhibition in 1984 of 169 artists but only 13 women, eight people of color. You see immediately no museum goer even cares at all. Imagine that's your aha moment when you realize there has to be a better way, an in your face, unforgettable way to break through people's preconceptions and prove to them that the art system is not a meritocracy where museums, galleries, critics, and collectors always know best. Imagine you dream up a new kind of street poster to wake people up to the pathetically low number of women artists and artists of color shown in galleries and museums. You call a meeting, you decide to be an anonymous, and you name yourselves Gorilla Girls. You pass the hat around to pay for printing, and within weeks you're sneaking around New York in the middle of the night carrying stacks of posters and buckets of glue. Your work ignites a public argument about sexism and racism in the art world and beyond. What follows? Hundreds of works, exhibitions, performances, workshops, books, not just about the lack of gender and ethnic diversity in art, but also in film, politics, and pop culture. You get thousands and thousands of messages from people all over the world, age 8 to 80, saying your crazy kind of activism is a model for them as well. Over 60 individuals become members of the Gorilla Girls. Some stay for months, some for decades, and a few stay just for a single meeting. 
They're cis, lesbian, and transgender, diverse in age, sexual orientation, and class, and from many ethnic backgrounds, Asian, South Asian, African American, Latinx, European, and so on. And each of us takes on the name of a dead woman artist as a pseudonym. You know, from our very beginning to today, we have fought against racism, sexism, museum corruption, income inequality, and sexual harassment and assault. And if you look through our new book, The Art of Behaving Badly, these foundational issues come through loud and clear. Today, we wanna to show you some of that trajectory from the beginning until now, some examples of our activist art organized by subject. So let's start, I'm gonna start with anti-racism. Um, let's see, with anti-racism. Anti this is one of our earliest posters from 1986. Only four galleries in New York show black women. Only one shows more than one. And this is a perfect example of how we craft our work using disruptive headlines, outrageous design and killer statistics. We try to twist an issue around and present it in a way that hasn't been seen before. Today, things are a bit better. But in 1989, when we did this poster, the top auction price for art by a living woman um, was so low. And even today, the top price is only 14% of the top price for a man, which is Jenny Saville, 12.4 million versus Jeff Koons, 91 million. In 19, oh, and just as an example, you know, how we twisted around, we could have done a poster that said, you know, there, are, there isn't enough um, art by, by women and, and, and people of color in your collection. But instead, we have a very, a headline that's kind of unforgettable and we follow it with a list of, you could have bought a work by every single one of these women in the list, in the list there um, for the same money you spent on one Jasper Johns painting at that time. In 1993, the Pace Gallery opened a show called All White that featured all white artworks by all white artists, and they were all men. And the New York Times did this, um, you know, gushing magazine story and magazine cover with a photo of, of those white male artists. So we had to call it what it was, not the early 20th century art movement suprematism, but white supremacism. In 2002, a bunch of women film directors asked us to do a billboard a few blocks from where the Oscars were being held in LA. And this is what we came up with, the anatomically correct Oscar. He's white and male, like almost everyone who wins. And of course, we had to back up uh, this as we always do with the statistics. You know, best director has never been awarded to a woman. 94% of the writing awards have gone to men. Only 3% of the acting awards have gone to people of color. And that just happened to be the year that Halle Berry and Denzel Washington won Oscars for their performances. A lot of times we update what we're doing. And this is a poster, a very recent poster, um, which was up in Minneapolis a few years ago during the Oscars So White protests. And if you look at these stats, not much had changed. Only 6% of the acting awards and 5% of the writing and directing awards have gone to people of color in 86 years. So this is, um, we always like to think about these commemorative months, you know, and kind of making, criticizing the fact that we have those months, but do we have real progress? And this is, is an interesting example of, of how, how we, you know, in everyone's work, um, and I'm sure many of you out there are artists, you have these issues in your own work too. Uh, you find something by chance. So we're designing this poster and there's this really long word, discrimination. So if you just imagine, you know, how do you even fit it on there? And suddenly, you know, light bulb, discrimination. Discrimination contains the world nation. 
And that's what's really made this poster. And right now it's a billboard on the Sunset Strip in LA. right with all the movie ads. This is a video we did in 2020 to honor the memory of all the black lives destroyed by police violence. Anti-sexism. The Guerrilla Girls formed to do street posters. And we started with the situation of women artists and artists of color. And these are some of our very earliest. We went after the art successful artists themselves and museums and galleries who participated in a rigged system. By 1988, the word on the street was, the Guerrilla Girls are so negative, all we do is complain, complain, complain. So we realized it was time to do a positive poster to make women artists feel better. It was an overnight sensation, and this is it, of course, the advantages of being a woman artist. And if you read the advantages, they're actually all disadvantages, which is another way we usually twist things around. We still get letters every week from people all over the world in every walk of life telling us this poster is the story of their lives too. And it's been translated into over 20 languages and appeared in many, many, many countries. You know, we love art and artists, but let's face it, the art system sucks. Of course, there are collectors, curators, and museums who advocate for a different art world and collect all kinds of work by diverse artists. But the art world is also filled with posers, snobs, gamblers, smugglers, tax dodgers, inside traders, insider traders, and even criminals. Plus the art market is unregulated. In fact, it's described as the fourth largest black market in the world after drugs, guns, and diamonds. Mm -hmm. So these days, um, okay, um, sorry, this is just another, where, where am I? I'm a little lost here, forgive me. Um, oh, well, we'll just, we'll just uh, move on. This is um, uh, another example of kind of how we twist things around, one of our film things. I think it got stuck here when it was supposed to be a little further. Okay, but now we're gonna go on to racism and sexism in museums. This is something we did for the um, Minneapolis Institute of Art, which was actually right on the walls in the lobby, big projection right on the walls in the lobby.
You know, even though we um, got all the statistics in that video you just saw from uh, the curators um, and director of the museum, they were still really shocked at the result and, and at this video. All right, which brings us to corruption and inequality in museums. This is a poster of ours um, from 1990, Gorilla Girls Code of Ethics for Art Museums. And recently, um, we decided that this monument really needed to be a real monument out in the public. So we started doing drawings for it. Um, the um, Gorilla Girls Code of Ethics for Museums Monument. We think this should be outside every museum in the city of New York and probably every museum everywhere. And um, once the pandemic is over, huh, yeah, right. Um, we are going to drag it all around New York. We're going to build this thing probably out of a lightweight substance and drag it on wheels all around New York in front of the different museums. So here's our proposed code. If thou exhibit art, mostly by white males, bought at the most expensive galleries, then donated by wealthy collectors, thou must rename it thyself the Museum of Rich People's Art. Thou shalt honor thy employees and pay all of them a living wage plus health insurance. Thou shalt show and collect lots of art by women and artists of color before they are dying or dead. Thou shalt not consort with art dealers or collectors who commit tax evasion, money laundering, insider trading, or smuggle antiquities. Thou shalt not prevent, permit billionaires who sell deadly addictive drugs, make tear gas, deny climate change, or undermine elections to art wash their reputations with huge donations and get their names in museum, on museum plazas. And finally, thou shalt admit that if thy museum does not show art or hire staff as diverse as the culture thou claim to represent, Thou art not showing the history of art. Thou art merely telling the story of wealth and power. In, um, you know, we look at it uh, this way. 
If the wealthiest country in the world is stuck with a system where the only way to fund culture is with philanthropy, philanthropy, I can't say that word, from the super rich, then maybe museums should only accept money from individuals who make the world a better, not a worse place. And this is uh, this poster, Wealth and Power, has now been all over the world, on streets everywhere, the bottom, uh, Kochi, India, um, on the right, Thailand, um, Los Angeles, um, you know, all over. Okay, in, 19, in 2015, we did a street campaign of stickers, billboards, and videos about art world income inequality and a stealth projection on the facade of the Whitney Museum. So the world of artists is great, but the art world sucks. The super rich are controlling the museums, sitting on the boards. Power is being centralized into these few rich people. Like it's really about the 1%. Unfortunately, our world right now appears to be about money and about the production of luxury items. Billionaires are making more and more and more, and their taste controls which artists get the big bucks and get the opportunities and get the shows. We're planning to sneak around New York with the Illuminator. So we'll be starting out in Chelsea and we hope to then go to the Whitney. So we had this idea to do something we could do really fast around New York and put these stickers up. Some of the stickers are about art galleries, about billionaires, billionaire collectors, and about museums. So we wanted to put them up where they belong, on the big galleries, on the museums, and give them out to people, especially so they could do the same thing. And it seemed like a great idea. Call the people together, just put the word out, see who comes, and just run around the streets and put these things up and bother people. It's going to be a Saturday in Chelsea, people walking around, feeling really good about having seen all this inspiring art, and all of a sudden, they're going to see the wall above start talking to them, and it's going to say, Dear Art Collector, we completely get. Collecting art is so expensive. We really understand why you can't afford to pay all your employees a living wage. The wall is going to talk to them. Every time we put something up, you know, people would go bananas. Some people would love it, some people would hate it. So we would sort of work in that space. It's really very productive to provoke people to think about things. And we discovered early on that if you could make someone who disagreed with you laugh, then you had a hook inside their brain. You know, once you were in there, you just might be able to change their minds about things. That brings us to our latest project. Art historians call it the male gaze. Gorilla girls call it the male graze. All those naked women in art museums all over the world, are they just luscious patterns of color and texture? Or is there more going on? What are they doing? What is being done to them? So we have this new website, um, themalegrays.com. And on it, we explore a lot of these topics that are, are so important to question today. Sexual exploitation, domination, abuse, and voyeurism are everywhere in our culture. When these themes are aestheticized, why does the discussion stop? The male graze isn't about censoring artworks or condemning sexuality as immoral in any way. It is about facing the fact that Western art is and has been obsessed with female bodies, sex, and violence. You know the art. 
but do you know but do you know the artist lots of male artists have exploited and abused women in their real lives does that bad behavior find its way into the work to have a deeper understanding of our culture, let's take a little look at art and artists straight on. In the age of Me Too, there's no going back. Did Lucian Freud really do all of this? The answer is yes. Had 14 children by six women and was rumored to have had twice as many. Never saw many of his children until he wanted them to model for him painted at least four of his daughters naked, one at age 14, got mad when one daughter refused to let him paint her six-year-old daughter naked, reconnected with an estranged son at a book launch, then asked if he could paint the son's wife naked, fathered three children by three different women all in the same year, impregnated a 16-year-old, said women go downhill after the age of 16, got Sir Lawrence Gowing, principal of the Slade School of Art, to admit young students he wanted to have sex with, had four children by a former student, never saw them, then wrote them out of his $162 million will. Who is really shortlisted for the Turner Prize? Turner was a cheapskate all his life, but left a small fortune in unsold paintings to support impoverished artists and to keep his name alive. He never paid housekeepers who lived with him he took and took care of him and had sex with him and bore his children. Late in life, he freeloaded at a boarding house run by his mistress. When he died, he left all of them out of his will, including the children he had ignored. But that's how come we have the Turner Prize. What did Picasso do after Francois Gillot left him? Cried, nope. He refused to see their children, found himself an even younger woman and ruined Gillot's career by pressuring galleries not to show her work. These artists were said to be violent toward women, to, uh, violent to their wives. Which one actually, only one, however, actually stood trial for her murder? And that, of course, is Carl Andre, who was acquitted. Today, many individuals are bravely speaking out. And we've heard rumors about discussions going on right now in museums, probably in this museum and every museum, about whether an artist's behavior should sometimes, always, ever, be disclosed in any explanation of his art. So we have some ideas about that. So let me set the stage. Okay, this is the official portrait of President Bill Clinton hanging in the National Portrait Gallery in DC, painted by an artist who like Clinton has been accused of sexual abuse. What should the portrait gallery say about this interesting coincidence? Well, we have some ideas. Three ways to write a museum wall label when the artist is a sexual predator. So of course, the first way we probably see all the time for museums afraid of alienating billionaire trustees and collectors who donated the artist's work. Chuck Close, American, Portrait of President Bill Clinton, 1992, Oil on Canvas, National Portrait Gallery, Washington, DC. Chuck Close is one of the most important artists of his generation and the creator of a new kind of portraiture consisting of patterns of color. For museums conflicted about disclosing an artist's abuse, Chuck Close is one of the most important artists of his generation and the creator of a new kind of portraiture consisting of patterns of color. Like many artists, he has had a few disgruntled employees. And finally, for museums who want some help from the Gorilla Girls, Chuck Close had a huge career with prices to match. He's been um, accused of sexually abusing models and students he picked up at fancy art schools. How fitting and ironic that he painted the official portrait of Bill Clinton. The art world tolerates abuse because it believes art is above it all and, and the rules do not apply to genius white male artists. Of course, we say wrong. And, and I'm sure as many of you do know, Chuck Close sadly died last week at the age of 80. But his art will live on in museums everywhere. 
And so will the criticism that artists must face today for their bad behavior. Art school, art world, confidential. Young students, horny professors, hooking up with students is not okay, but it still happens. Schools are slow to respond to complaints and often negligent. So there are lots of interesting stories of art professors creating hostile conditions in class, preying on the young students to have sex with them, impregnating them, and then getting rid of any female faculty that get in their way. And there are administrators who pimp for male professors, paid for the silent and, and you know, and hid or paid for the silence of pregnant students or just did nothing. And it doesn't stop after art school. The art world is a hierarchy with mostly men at the top who continue this bad behavior or look the other way when their colleagues engage in it. So here's a project we did very recently. What did the Museum of Modern Art do when it came out that its board president gave Je convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein $200 million. And then he was accused of sexual abuse himself. And what they did, of course, was basically nothing at first. Leon Black, billionaire, big time collector and owner of Fight and Press gave $40 million to the Museum of Modern Art. And despite all the dirt on him, um, he, it took him almost a year after this all came out for him to uh, quit being chair. And there's still a gallery in the museum named after him. He hasn't really confessed his connections to Epstein, but he did give Epstein, you know, two hundred million dollars for something. And there's more. A young Russian single mother. Um, has claimed that Black, Black trapped her for years in an abusive sexual relationship through manipulation, threats, coercion, and they're having a big lawsuit about it now. So we put this message to Black and Glenn Dubin, another Epstein pal on MoMA's board, on a phone booth right outside the museum. Advice to the Museum of Modern Art about big donors with big ties to Jeffrey Epstein. MoMA should kick Leon Black and Glenn Dubin off its board immediately, drape the Black and Dubin galleries in black, and put up wall labels explaining why. And of course, the Gorilla Girls would be happy to help write those wall labels. Also on the mailgraze.com, um, people can tell their own stories or um, mend their, their evil ways with apologies and comment in any way on what we're doing, what other people are doing and anything that they care about. You know, we were asked to do a giant outdoor project in London, which um, with the pandemic, with COVID got kind of knocked down to this website and also uh, 12 billboards all over the UK. So we decided to do something we've been asking people to do informally for a long time, help us count what's in the museums. Um, go to your favorite museum, count the number of naked women in the artworks and then tally it up and send it to us. And we have a, ta oh, and this, these are the billboards that were all over London of this poster in every, in every kind of way, uh, all over the UK, excuse me. And um, you can, anyone can go to any museum, do their count and uh, input it right on this page of, of that actual website. We think uh, the results have been really interesting so far. We'd love to have you participate and do some more. And um, we think that actions like this will change the way we all look at art forever. And now, one more thing. Okay, several years ago, the Guerrilla Girls were invited to give the commencement address at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in front of thousands of students, screaming students, and quite a few really angry parents. Afterwards, we turned our speech into a video, kind of our manifesto. 
the Gorilla Girl's Guide to Behaving Badly, which you have to do most of the time in the world as we know it. Be a loser. The world of art doesn't have to be an Olympics where a few win and everyone else is forgotten. The art market and its hyper-competitive celebrity culture makes everyone but the stars feel like failures. But there's another world out there that's not about raging egos, a world of artistic cooperation and collaboration. That's the one we join and we invite you to join it too. Let's make trouble together. Be crazy. Political art or activism that points to something and says, this is bad. It's just preaching to the converted. Instead, try to change people's minds and do it in some unforgettable way. A trick we learned is humor helps you fly under the radar. If you can get people who disagree with you to laugh at an issue, you have a hook right into their brain. Once there, you have a much better chance to convert them. Be anonymous. Sometimes you got to speak out publicly, but sometimes it works even better to speak out anonymously. Now, this has its disadvantages, like working your whole life without getting any credit, but it has lots of advantages too. Our anonymity, for example, keeps the focus on the issues and away from our personalities. The mystery of who we might be draws lots of attention to the issues we promote. Plus, you won't believe what comes out of your mouth while wearing a gorilla mask. Be an outsider. Even if you're working inside a system, we say act like an outsider. Seek out the understory, the subtext, the overlooked, and the downright unfair. Then expose it. Jam your culture. Remake your institution. Just do one thing. If it works, do another. If it doesn't, do another anyway. Don't be paralyzed if you don't get it right every time. Just keep chipping away. We promise that bit by bit, your efforts will add up to something effective. Artists, don't make only expensive art that billionaire art collectors can afford. Curators, don't exhibit only the expensive art your trustees donate. Let's have more cheap art that everyone can own, like books, zines, music, and movies, like our posters. Show museums tough love. It's unethical that wealthy art collectors who invest lots of money in art can become museum trustees, overseeing institutions that in turn validate their investments. It's a lousy way to write and preserve our history. Demand ethical standards inside museums. No more conflicts of interest or insider trading. No more cookie-cutter collections of art that cost the most. Convince art collectors their collections are inferior with only work by white male artists don't let museums perpetuate this version of art and power with a few tokens thrown in make sure your favorite museum casts a wider net and collects the whole story of our culture whether you work at a museum or a classroom don't teach an art history constructed by corrupt institutions do like we did write your own complain 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 be a creative complainer be a professional complainer don't assume people know what's missing from museums remind them how many modern and contemporary art collections still contain less than 15 percent females and artists of color use the f word feminism we think it's crazy that so many people who believe in the tenets of feminism are still afraid to call themselves feminists feminism doesn't get the respect it deserves women's rights civil rights Rights, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights, and Black Lives Matter are the great human rights movements of our times. Feminists like us who believe in intersectionality fight for all human rights. No one is free until everyone is free. Feminism is changing the world. It's revolutionizing human thought, given many people lives their great grandparents could never have imagined. But there's still so much work to do. There are so many countries worldwide where LGBTQ people and women have little or no human rights. 90% of transgender employees have faced discrimination or harassment at work. In the U.S., no federal law protects them, even though nearly 80% of voters support such a law. Then there's rampant sexism in the tech industry, including the harassment of female gamers. And what about the gender earning gap that the U.S. Congress refuses to move against? Violence and abuse against women, gay, and transgender people is still a huge international problem, from gang rape in India to kidnappings in Nigeria to sexual slavery by ISIS to the next negligible punishment given out for domestic violence in America. Trans women are assaulted and even murdered in the U.S. But despite all this bad news, feminist resistance movements are exploding all over the world. Let's make the F word feminism the F word for the future. Let's all join together with feminists on the right side of history. All right. We have, I think, a few minutes, maybe for a question or two. We do. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I have to say just once that video, I'm so glad that about the cheap art, because that's something that I 
personally really believe in, you know, the, oh, there's so many things that are wonderful. And it's not just the things that sell that are wonderful. And something that I'm very proud of our institution that we show things um, alongside one of Jeffrey Katzen, who curated the show that your work is in, said, you know, it's pretty wonderful when you don't think about where the art came from, but what works together. And he was talking about something from an artist, um, John Sokol, who's a regional artist who does really wonderful work and works in really non-traditional media like pine tar. And it's in the same gallery as um, Philip Gustin and Lee Bontecue. And, you know, those all matter. They don't all come from the same gallery, but they all matter. So I really appreciated that moment um, in your video, but we do have some questions. Um, I also, one of the questions that came up was you mentioned, uh, you said philanthropy and you, you were sort of stumbled over the word. And today actually in a meeting, my colleagues and I were sort of joking about how uh, philandry and philanthropy sound sort of similar um, because we were talking about sort of the funding we we're trying to figure out you know about so many things we want to do and funding and so somebody's question was um, as as an artist how do you deal with sort of the business of art it's pretty stressful yes I mean all artists uh, you know the world of artists is great and luckily you cannot stop artists from doing their work um, whether they've become rich and famous off it or whether hardly anybody has seen it. And, th and that's true in every field of culture and it's why we have culture. In the art world, there's been um, several decades where the same advisors have been advising the same um, wealthy, collect wealthy people and they're all collecting the same collection basically. So there's this new ultra high price superstar uh, machine, which is you know great for the artists and some of the artists are really great, but it's terrible for the history of art because we don't want to look at a, at a museum a hundred years you know a hundred years in the future if people are looking back at a museum today do we really want to see that every museum in the country has the same art you know the same uh, 10 artists of each generation, because once these people who support the museum buy the art, they eventually donate it or they, you know, they want to see shows often of their own collections. And sometimes it's a lot easier to uh, get a show when you're a collector of your collection than mm -hmm. for an artist to be shown in a museum. And I applaud you for talking about your local artists because that is so important that museums support um, the artists, you know, don't buy into that notion of there's the big time and then there's people right. who somewhere else. It is so untrue. There's so many wonderful artists all over the place. I mean, Ohio is Ohio is a, is a big state. We're a populous state. We have some wonderful artists. I think your point is really good too. Um, I just hadn't thought of it that way. You're right. Like I had previously worked at an encyclopedic museum and there's so many um, surprises that we might be losing because we're collecting all the same thing. Uh, you brought up our local artists and some, one of our, I'm very proud of my colleagues who've worked with dozens and dozens of regional artists um, in this year, many of whom identify as women and femme. And I, um, one of the questions that came through is, as uh, somebody who identifies as either a woman or femme, um, how has the practice of working in Guerrilla Girls changed your own art making practice? You know, that's a question everyone would answer differently. And I have to say that, um, you know, I don't want to say too much about, about anything that I do, but there are some of us whose work before the Guerrilla Girls had was very similar in issues and in um, different ways of looking at things and stuff like that. And I am one of those, which makes sense since I'm one of the founders of the Guerrilla Girls and still part of it today. Um, you know, we've had all these members over the years and they've been, they've been diverse as people, but also diverse in their, in their art practices. Um, but there have been many who, whether it's in their art or not, are very interested and knowledgeable and care about issues in the world. You wouldn't become a girl girl if you didn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. 
So I know that we talked previously, but I, at the beginning of my career when I was in graduate school, uh, worked in an institution that had the Gorilla Girls speak, and I got to meet the Gorilla Girls, and we figured out that we had been we had been in the same room once. Um, and so my own question is, how has being a Gorilla Girl changed over time? And I will say for all the people, it was 20 years ago <laughs> that we did. It was right after 9-11, actually. Well, in the basic way, it hasn't changed. We're always trying to do something better, do something more meaningful, do something with the power to change people's minds. And this kind of strategy that we invented uh, for doing a new kind of political art is somebody is something anybody can um, kind of get off on and use if you look at a bunch a bunch of our work. So I don't think. In, in a sense, we've been working under the same paradigm, but always trying to extend our critique, critique, take on new subjects, um, because we were formed to do posters, not to be a talking group. Uh, we don't have to talk all that much about, I mean, obviously we do argue about the issues, but we, we don't have to talk all that much about um, what to try to do something with. It's mm -hmm. more about how to craft something that truly has the power, and it doesn't work all the time, of course, to um, change people's minds. So it's, it's not different in a lot of ways. One way that it's hugely different is when you put a poster up on the street in New York, one minute later, someone comes and slaps another poster right over. So how do we even know, you know, when we put our first posters up, all hell broke loose. And it's hard to understand why, since they were disappeared like in a second. Now, um, we are in touch with people all over the world. We work with people. We, um, you know, we've probably done two or 300 exhibitions in many, many different countries. We do special projects for people, including museum interventions, like some of the ones that I show tonight, but also some more uh, stealth ones that weren't, you know, uh, sanctioned by wherever we're doing it at all. And we still love to be on the street best. You know, we're lucky that now we can do giant banners, giant billboards. Um, and take on the street in lots of different ways. But we still do posters and put them up on the street too. Hmm. You know, I have to say um, what you just said really reminded me of a moment I hadn't realized or I had, which was that um, as part of the talk that you gave, I was part of a workshop. So in graduate school, I was in this workshop and something you said, you said you don't have to do a lot of talking. And actually that was something you said then as well, that you talked about <laughs> posters and how those posters have to do the talking by saying less. And you talked a lot about, we did um, a poster as a collect, as our group workshop about um, during 9-11, uh, which actually now is very relevant um, for COVID. We had um, how much terrorism threat we had ha in the country. And so we did a poster about that, which is about sexism, how much threat there was and you said, actually, all you need is the graphic. You don't need to do a lot of talking to really get at people. Um, and I forget about, I forgot about it, but that has actually stuck with me in a lot of my other work in museums. So thank you for that. Um, you re reminded me of that. Um, we have one last question. There was a couple other questions. Somebody did ask, one of my colleagues asked, is it hard to keep being part of Gorilla Girls secret? Um, so I, that, that, that's an easy question, but I wanna ask you also a bigger question, which is the question that, um, uh, somebody else asked, but I think it's a good place to end. Um, one of the things that I think really is challenging about whenever we show art that um, has political issues or things that are really stressful, a lot of us think, well, how do we make it change? And so in this case, the question was about the art market. How can people who are museum visitors or people in a community, how do you change equity for artists and make it a better place for artists? Equity for artists, what do you mean by that? Uh, they were asking about, we were talking about artists, you know, like regional artists wanting to make a living with artists. And so yeah. that's what they were asking about. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think I have an answer for that. Um, <laughs> it's a hard one, right? Well, you know, even as a baby artist, I was in some survey where they were asking, you know, how much do you make on your art? You know, how much of your living do you make on your art? And when the results came back, um, you know, I was a really young artist and wasn't, wasn't uh, doing that well then, but I was in the 99th percentile. So 
the gazillionaire artists are in the same one as I am, that shows how hard it is. It's very hard to make a living as an artist. And a lot of artists do have day jobs or um, they do different kinds of work. You know, there isn't just the museum kind of work now. There's an incredible explosion of creativity in so many ways and so many media and in the media, you know, and, um, uh, online, you know, in, in every way. So there's, I think art is about ideas and that's the important thing, not, not, what, mm -hmm. not whether you decide to make one of a kind objects or make infinitely reproducible stuff like we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, I think to me, a power of uh, Gorilla Girls is that it is reproducible. I mean, we, I said that's very transgressive, right? Not to be unique, but to be multipliable. Um, I'm going to go back because we have one last last minute question, but it's from a teenager, somebody who's 16 years old is um, asking, and it goes back to sort of the same question my colleague asked today, you know, is it hard to be anonymous? The 16 year old is asking, why be anonymous? You've changed the world. You mean, lots of students, I used to teach Art History 101, and I used your book. You know, why be anonymous when you're such a big deal now? I think, I think the good part, well, when we did it in the first place, it was really self-serving. The little New York Art Road was a small clubby place and we were afraid people wouldn't listen to some of us because they hated our work or something, you know? So we wanted it to be anonymous. And there's a great tradition of anonymous activism, you know, centuries of anonymous activism. So we wanted, we felt very comfortable being part of that. And we then we quickly realized that the kind of delicious secret who we might be actually helped us. It kind of drew people to our cause. The mystery was uh, seductive. And that was a good thing too. These days, it's just kind of our shtick, you know? I mean, that's what a gorilla girl is. <laughs> um, it's not real, it's, it's important that we're, that we're the group rather than individuals, I think. We have plenty of time to be individuals in our own mm -hmm. life. Um, so that is important. But, you know, over all this time with over 60 members, um, you know, we've always been small at one time, at any one time. Um, but our current members, I don't think have an interest in coming out. Some of our older members, former members do. And, you know, that's their, that's their privilege. I'm not ready to do that yet. Well, good. I'm glad that you're still with us. I'm glad that I got to um, pass cross paths with you again. Um, I'm, I'm in the middle of my career, I'd like to think. <laughs> and I'm very thankful that you joined us today. We're out of time. Um, I'm hearing from my colleagues, but thank you so much. And I appreciate everybody and you as well, who put up with our early technical difficulties. And I really hope that they enjoyed the lecture. And I very much hope that they either come to the museum and see the exhibition, Totally Radical, which closes on September 19th, or they enjoy it online because we know the world is global. So thank you very much. Have a good day.